Hi guys, it's family meeting time. To borrow a phrase from my dear cheetah sister, Glennon Doyle. Um, this family meeting in particular is for my fellow sag after members, but the family meeting really, I think relates to all of us in terms of advocating for our worth and in terms of putting our foot down in the arenas where it really matters. And while there are many failings in this new proposed sag after contract that has come up from our union, uh, the greatest of those failings to me, and I think uh, to many people in my audience out there, are the failings in terms of onset protections during scenes which have the potential to exploit performers. Um, scenes of a sexual nature, scenes requiring any kind of nudity or intimacy. And I've been having a lot of calls with a lot of sag after folks. And this morning I had a call with some of my union sisters and some of the folks at Time's Up. Now, being part of Time's Up is an enormous honor for me and the work that Time's Up is doing to advocate in our own industry, but also across industries to make sure that employees do not feel like they are subjected to sexual harassment and assault and bad behavior is incredibly important. And I think that any of you who follows me, who has seen my post about why I personally believe that sag after members need to vote no on this contract, saw me post about the differences between the protections which were not afforded to performers here in the US and the historic protections that were won by our sister union in Canada called ACTRA. If you haven't seen it, I'm gonna take you through them now, but our phone call this morning left me in a state of even more frustration and left me feeling even more betrayed than I'd been feeling before, which, you know was already a lot because I was informed of all the work that's been happening behind the scenes and of the list of protections provided to SAG-AFTRA by Time's Up, by the lawyers who work at that, com the, at that organization, the folks who knew what would be winnable for us in a contract, the experts, the experts on protecting women and vulnerable people in the workplace. And sag after has had that list for over a year. They made us promises. They made promises to sister friends of mine in my union who shall remain nameless because this is my complaint but not theirs, but I can tell you all that you know and love all of the women I'm thinking about right now. They're women that I look up to. They're women that I consider friends and mentors. They're women who I trust and they were promised by SAG leadership that these protections would be the hill that leadership would be willing to die on for us. They would never give up. And they gave up on us. And I'm, I'm really sad for us, you know? A lot's wrong in the world right now, but it's also 2020. Uh, the Me Too movement that Tarana Burke spent 10 years seeding in the world exploded in, into Hollywood and into kind of global press in 2017. Time's Up came out of that. I would think that all people, and especially in my industry, uh, performers and the studios would have expected uh, the Me Too movement and, and Time's Up to create a new and safer way forward on sets. And our protections were really given away. So real quickly for the folks who wanna focus on this issue in particular, I'm gonna run you through some facts from the Dissenting Opinion website. It's dissentingopinion2020.com for any of my sag after people out there. Please go read up. Uh, our union is claiming historic wins but not actually telling us what any of them are. And when you find out what they're not, it's pretty upsetting. Um, I wanna talk though specifically in this live just about sexual exploitation on sets because I know that in the one Julie and I did last week, we talked for an hour and it can be hard to find the information you're looking for. So tonight, today, this is what we're talking about. So in Canada, and this was a recommendation of Time's Up and the legal protection folks over there, in Canada, 
the actor contract has limited essential workers on a set to five. So let's say, for example, myself and my co-star, um, me and my friend Jacqueline Taboni, for example, on Easy, we have a love scene to do. Essential workers on set other than she and I would be five people. So the director, the director of photography, um, probably a sound guy, probably a camera guy, and if the camera's on a dolly, a dolly grip. That feels pretty reasonable, right? Well, in the US, in this new supposedly historic win, SAG-AFTRA got us no limit on crew members on set and no description whatsoever of who is essential. Now, crews on sets typically run anywhere from upwards of 60 to 70 folks to 125, depending on how big your production is. And I certainly would not, as a performer in a compromising position for many hours while shooting a scene, feel safe having 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 eyes on my exposed body. Nor do I need to, nor does any performer need to, because there's just not that many people required on set for an intimate scene that deserves extra protection. So Canada, five people. The United States, no limit. In Canada, you get a complete disclosure of what the scene involves, a storyboard, a script for the scene, a location of where the scene will be, i.e. it's going to be on the bedroom set of character B, or it's going to be uh, shot in a hotel at this location, or it's gonna be, I don't know, in the woods, like maybe you're making a cool, fun show on location like Riverdale and something spicy's happening out in the forest, whatever. They have to tell you where and when this is happening and how they're intending to shoot it. In the US, under the new SAG-AFTRA proposed contract, we get sides, meaning the script pages for the scene, only, and in quotes from the deal, if practicable. They don't have to tell us what the scene involves, uh, they don't have to give us the script, and they don't have to give us a location for warning and comfort. Uh, they just have to show us the scene if it's practicable, which basically means if it's convenient, and if we all have learned anything looking at systemic injustice around the world, um, power structures don't often say, you know what's super easy for me? Empowering the people in my arena with the least power. It's not how they work. So I would be willing to bet a substantial, I don't even know, I don't know what I'm willing to bet, uh, but I'd place a strong bet on the fact that companies or sets or directors or bosses or producers will say well it wasn't practicable you know it really wasn't easy for us to settle that down things are crazy the location's changing there's always an excuse so if it's not required it doesn't happen in the canadian actor contract actors can always have a support person in an audition and on set with them in the u.s we have no such guarantee now I may not need a support person on a set with me if I've been working with this group of people for a while, I trust them. What if it's my first episode of a show? What if I am a 21-year-old performer who has to go work on a show or a film and do a love scene? Don't I deserve to be able to take my mom or my manager or someone who can make me feel like I have an ally on set so that if a director makes a suggestion of, I know it's not scripted, but what if we just get you out of your shirt and bra and give you a pair of pasties and we do the scene that way? I've had that happen to me and I didn't have that happen to me when I was 21. I had that happen to me the most recently when I was 33, many years into a show with a director who I really trusted in front of my whole crew. It was shocking, it was inappropriate, and I didn't have a single person on set to advocate with me. So me as a female performer got into an argument in front of my entire crew with my boss. It sucked. The idea that our sister union in the same year in the negotiations with the same studios has guaranteed a support person in an audition room and on set for performers and we here with sag after have not feels insane to me. Also under the ACTRA contract in Canada, intimacy coordinators are specifically defined and encouraged. There are requirements for this in the Canadian contract. In our contract here in the US, they're not mentioned. And the reason they're not mentioned is because we've been told there are only 40 intimacy coordinators here in the US currently. We would never have enough for all of our sets. So my suggestion is if these studios, which by the way, we want to work with, 
are making record-breaking profits, which, by the way, we want them to make because if studios are making record-breaking profits, it means more good content gets funded. It means shows like I May Destroy You by Michaela Cole get on the air at HBO. It means that cool, incredible movies that go straight to streaming, they get made. Things that would have been considered gambles before have a better shot. So let me tell you, this isn't actors versus studios. This is simply making sure everyone's as protected as possible. So my idea, again, with a little bit of background, if the studios are making record-breaking profits, and I'm talking billions, not annually, but per quarter, meaning every quarter of the year, meaning t take billions of dollars times four, and now we're talking annual money, why can't all the studios throw like, I don't know, 25 million bucks a piece into a pot that starts an independent company? So no one really knows where the money comes from. They're not like people who work for HR, which is conflict of interest and, and strange to begin with, but we could actually start a company that would train and employ intimacy coordinators. And that company then would be well-funded because there's plenty of money to do this. And think about all the jobs that could be created. Think about all the folks who have gotten degrees in psychology, all the social workers, like we're talking about jobs going up. This feels like a good idea to me. So I don't know why We've said, well, we don't have enough intimacy coordinators under the sag after contract, so can't guarantee it. And studios have a right of refusal, which, again, if they have the right of refusal, they'll refuse. And we've said, well, we don't have enough of these people, but you also can't have a support person on set with you who you trust, like your manager or your mom or whoever it might be. So essentially, we've given away the two layers of protection we might have gotten, and the Canadian contract got both feels like more failure in Canada. And this is really important. We gotta talk about background. Anyone who's watching this, who's worked background on a show, um, knows that it's like grueling and crazy and also kind of fun. And you guys are really valuable. And background actors come and go. They often have other jobs they work. And a lot of those folks are trying to like make it into the industry. So they're coming to sets to be around production and around actors who are regulars on shows to learn. And it's really valuable education. So in Canada, all performers, including background actors, get 48 hours of notice of nudity in a scene. They get the script and activity expectation and get this, background who's going to be nude in a scene gets the same pay as principal actors for any intimate work. Now here's why this is important. Anybody out there a Westworld fan? I'm a huge Westworld fan. Let's think about the scene where, oh God, who, who, what is his name? This is my problem. I can't remember anyone's real names because I think of people as their TV characters. Doesn't matter. Two of the characters like ride into a, a part of town and it's nighttime and it's dark and the light is like really gold and sparkly and everything's beautiful and everybody's like naked. It's like this hedonistic, crazy party happening, right? Because Westworld is like robot fantasy land. It was gorgeous, but a lot of those people who were naked were background folks. Now, here's where things get tricky. As a background actor, if you are like, I don't want to be naked on that show, even though I really like it or I want to work on it, you should have that right. In Canada, with the Actra deal, this 48 hours notice means that you, as a background player, can say to the you know first AD who's calling you or the agency that's booking you saying, hey, are you available Friday for an overnight shoot? P.S. You gotta be naked. The actor can say, I'm so sorry, you know what? I'm working a double at my regular job. I can't come in on Friday. Now, maybe that's not true, but they can at least say, I'm, a, I'm unavailable. They don't have to say, I'm actually really unwilling to do that. In the US, our background gets, quote, best effort of notification of nudity. Again, if it isn't required, it doesn't happen. We all know this to be true. Like we have to, we have to stop expecting the best and we actually have to negotiate for it. So they get best effort of, of notification and they can turn down work on the day and still get paid. Meaning if you show up to the set of this show where you're expected to be nude or partially nude and you find out about it, you can say, I don't wanna do that and you still get paid. But here's what happens, y'all. This is where we know things like retaliation come in because that AD, if he's got 25 men and women or non-binary actors who out of 100 who say, we're really not comfortable with this, we'd like to be paid and leave, his background count, which was supposed to be at 100, is now 75. 
He's on the hook, that AD, for having 25 less people than he was supposed to. You know what happens to all those background actors? They get labeled as difficult. They go on a do not call back list. And I can tell you they do because we have those on sets. When someone is inappropriate, we've, you know, over the years I've encountered a background person or two who's come in and been really lewd with some performers, um, had some inappropriate behavior, and, and rightfully so, there's like, there's a list, don't call that person. It's for the protection of everyone on the crew, right? But people who, and let's be honest, very often women who don't wanna subject themselves to sexual objectification also get labeled as difficult. This is not okay. The Canadian contract with the 48 hours notice means you don't ever have to tell someone why you're not gonna do that scene. Here in the US, someone trying to break into the industry has to look at the person who just gave them their job and say, I don't really wanna do that. I'm gonna go and then risk never getting hired again. So best effort of notification, not good enough. Now, for love scenes, intimate scenes, sexually explicit scenes, whatever you wanna call them, under the Canadian Actra contract, photography that is not used in the final process, meaning once picture is locked and the scene is edited, is destroyed. In the US, under this new proposal, there is no promise to destroy that photography. Now again, let me explain to my, my, our friends and supporters out there what this really means for us as performers. Scenes take on average anywhere from two to three hours per script page to shoot. Now, when those scenes get edited into a film or a movie, a two page scene can be anywhere from, I don't know, two to four minutes long. But if it's taking three hours a page, we're looking at six hours of footage for four minutes of screen time. That means that actors who are doing a love scene have six hours of footage of their most vulnerable, exposed bodies recorded somewhere. And when those four minutes of the scenes get done and the negotiated terms are stuck to, so, you know, these actually, these happen in contracts. Like you can see the upper quarter of actresses right buttock only on, you know, page one of said scene. It's like really specific, but Stuff that isn't agreed to be in the final cut is filmed. Your body is filmed. You trust your people to protect you. Where does that footage go? Why is it okay that six hours of my body or your body is just gonna sit somewhere? And by the way, guys, we're not back in the 50s. It's not film that's locked in a canister, locked in a closet at a movie studio, this is digital stuff that lives on multiple people's computers. These are the kinds of images that get hacked, trafficked, sold. People get exposed in the most inappropriate and vulnerable ways. And here in the US, we didn't get the protection that in the same negotiation in the same year our sister performers in Canada got with the same studios. Photography destroyed in the actor deal. No promise to destroy in the SAG after deal. And we're supposed to consider this a win? In the ACTRA contract, again, Canadian, there is a full definition of a closed set. So not only have essential workers been limited to five, there are no monitors allowed. In the US, we allow monitors. We don't define a closed set. We do not limit essential workers to five. And supposedly under this new deal, anyone viewing the monitor has to identify themselves to you as an actor. So it's supposed to make me feel better if 76 dudes on my set say, hey girl, while you shoot this love scene, I'm gonna be watching you naked on this little screen over here. That doesn't make me feel better. That doesn't make me feel protected. And let's be honest, we're all doing this on a smartphone right now. Everybody's got an iPhone. Everybody's got a smartphone. Everybody's got a Samsung, like whatever it is you have in your pocket. It's a professional camera. You're gonna tell me that there's not one person ever on a set who's not gonna like risk sneaking a pic of the actress or the actor that their best friend has a crush on while they're naked and sending it in a text message? It's not okay. We can't assume people are gonna be on their best behavior. We have to require it legally. We have to erase the danger of exposure for our performers. This is not appropriate. And at the end of it, Canada, under the ACTRA deal, allows 50% approval of body doubles and reviews of final cuts, meaning you get to look at footage and make sure that they didn't put something in a scene that they agreed not to. We don't get that. We don't get a guarantee of that. And as a person who has definitely been exploited in those terms, 
who has agreed so specifically that I've watched a shot, I've gotten to watch the monitor, I know exactly what part of my body's supposed to be exposed, and then I get to watching the film or the show, and I go, oh, tricky, cool. So the camera guy shot it differently than he promised me he would, and the director's probably the one who ordered him to do that. That's dark. It doesn't feel good. Guys, this is not an appropriate deal. And they're trying to say that they've won because of modesty garments. Modesty garments, which are always made available to us by our wardrobe departments. They don't, they haven't had to be contracted before because wardrobe does this, it's standard common practice. The number of shades and cuts and types of sticky bras and nude underwear, and do you want a thong? And do you want a modesty sock for a guy? And do you want like, you know, a little brief? Do you want a, do you want a modesty patch that goes literally like over your private parts? I've never, I would die, I'm, I'm far too bashful, but to people who feel like they can rock it, good for you, you look great. These things are standard common practice. They're asking us to rejoice that they got a guarantee of a robe on set between takes. Again, wardrobe does that. That's standard. If you're doing a scene like this, the minute that somebody cuts, you've got someone from wardrobe running in to give you a robe because it's uncomfortable to be standing in a room full of other people with your clothes off. These are not wins. And guys, to know specifically that over a year ago, the folks at Time's Up spelled out a writer spelled out the details of what we needed to get to ensure that practices of harassment and abuse could be stopped. And we didn't get it. And our other union did. Our Canadian union did. Same studios, same negotiation. I don't understand how in good conscience our leadership could be telling us right now that these are historic wins or gains. I just don't get it. So yeah, there's a lot going on in the world right now, obviously, and I'm trying my best to post about all of it and to educate about all of it and to, to really make sure that I spend far more time on other communities um, and other issues that are bigger for the globe outside of our own. But also, all those SAG folks, you are my own. Principal actors, background actors, day players, dancers, we are a team. And our union is supposed to advocate for us. And I'm incredibly frustrated by the gross lack of protection that we're getting out of this new deal. I'm incredibly frustrated that we're being told that they're historic wins. They're not. I'm incredibly frustrated that until the dissenting opinion voices complained that the only button on the SAG website with which to vote in this election was a yes button. There was no option online to vote no until we complained about it. I'm upset about voter suppression too. I'm upset about a lot of things for us. And we've got a lot of work to do and there's a lot for us to do in society, but this vote is due next week. And so I'm gonna talk about it until the day the day after, because I just don't believe that this is okay. So sag after members, I need you to read the fine print. I want you to read the deal. I want you to go to dissentingopinion2020.com and read what we've missed and read about what we're losing, because there are losses that are also going to deeply affect some of our long-lived incredible career performers and I don't think we're supposed to throw our own out of the lifeboat here. Um, I want you guys to go and read it and my hope is that any sag after members who are voting vote no. I hope that you can share this with your friends in the industry. Um, any of you who know actors, please send them this video. Please send them the dissenting opinion 2020.com website. Please encourage them to get educated on what's going on here because the idea that we are being left vulnerable, uh, that our personhood can be violated in ways like this continuously where our industry has been making big promises to change feels wrong. So thank you all for tuning in. Sorry to 
kind of be a downer, but I think we have to be educated about the facts even when they're not pretty so that we can go out there and help try to lead the revolution to make them better, right? Uh, to anybody who's out there in my sag after community, I love you guys. I want us to fight together for each other. And I hope, I hope that we can go back to the drawing board on this. You know, I, one other thing I want to address before I go, actually, there's this opinion from leadership online that if we go back to the drawing board, we'll get a worse deal. First of all, how dare you tell studios we'll accept a worse deal? And second of all, that's not how negotiating works. If we as a union vote no on this, then the studios go, well, shit, we got to give them something else. We have to give them something to vote yes. There's these, these uh, people who are saying, you know, if we go back, then we're going to have to strike. No, we don't. Nobody's striking, but we're also not working. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We've never actually had more leverage than we do right now because we can't work. We all want to, we all want to go back to work. But if we're sitting at home trying to do our part, why not fight harder for each other? Studios are apparently, this is the number I heard and if I'm wrong, somebody please let me know, but I've heard that by December, they're gonna be out of over 80% of all their new content feels like they need us. We need them too. I have a show that I can't wait to get back to work and start shooting. I'm like honestly so excited about it. I'm still reading medical books. We've been in quarantine for four months. You think I'd be over it? I'm not. I'm really deep in. I can't wait to go back and work with my co-stars, my writers, my studio. I'm really excited about it. But I can't. None of us can. So I really think that if there's ever been a time for us to hold out, it's now. A no vote doesn't mean we strike. A no vote simply means we go back to the table and we get a better deal. And we deserve that, guys. We're, we're part of this machine that makes art and also makes big global profit. And we need to be treated as collaborators and cohorts, not as an afterthought. So thank you all, much appreciated. If you agree with me, please consider voting no. I'm not here to tell you how to vote, but I'm certainly gonna tell you how I hope you will because I think that this is really the only way forward for us. Oh, hey, Amani, I can't wait for Good Sam either. I mean, honestly, can't wait to go back to work, but you know, fight the good fight until we do. Uh, so yeah, guys, dissentingopinion2020.com. Pass this on to all your actor friends, your performer friends, your stunt friends. Um, stunts aren't getting any help with this new contract either. and. Our stunt people, like, those are our people. Anyway, I could go on and on. I appreciate you, and uh, keep at it, y'all. Talk to you soon.